Hello, and welcome to the KV Audio Stories channel. We hope you will have fun with us. Enjoy listening. The topic of today's podcast is an audio story about a cheating wife, her infidelity, and betrayal. This like story will be especially helpful to those who are looking for the best way to get revenge on an unfaithful spouse. But enough with the spoilers. So the story begins. Hello, is this Luke Hall? No, my name is Luke Brown. My wife Luna kept her maiden name Hall. Well, this is Dr. Sahid Alwari. Six months ago, your wife and I began an affair here in the hospital. What? What is this, a joke? No, she was one fine piece of ass and a great slut. Listen, I don't have time. The reason for my call is that I am about to return to Saudi Arabia. And about two months ago, your wife left me for a new doctor, Gregory Zenger. I hope you are not a weak cuckold and will take revenge. Wait a minute, how do I know you're telling the truth? Well, if you get to storage room 506 at the hospital in the next 15 minutes, you can probably catch her and Gregory doing this. Sorry, my plane is landing. Good luck, Cook. Reeling from the revelation, Luke found himself trapped in a whirlwind of disbelief and betrayal. Could Luna, the woman he cherished above all, truly be entangled in such deceit? The very thoughts seemed to mock the sanctity of their marriage and the family they had built together. Luke, often considered a man of patience and reflection, found himself grappling with a tumult of emotions, his mind racing for a sliver of truth amidst the chaos. It was then that a possible ally flickered into his thoughts. Jerry, a neighbor whose friendship had grown over the years, not least because of their shared connection to the hospital. Jerry, with his role as a security guard within those very walls, might just hold the key to unraveling this unsettling mystery. He dialed Jerry's number, tapping into the network that connected him to a potential truth seeker in this storm of uncertainty. Hello, Jerry Austin Security. How can I help? Jerry, this is Luke. Listen, are you at work? Yes, I'm doing my rounds now. What's the matter? Maybe it's nothing special, but some Arab doctor just called me and said Luna was having an affair. She and some other doctor are supposedly having sex right now in storage room 506. Is there any way to get in there, and if she's there, take pictures? Guy, are you sure? Luna, no, I'm not sure. That's why I need you to find out. Please, I need this service. No problem. I definitely owe you for all the carpentry work you did for me. I'm already close. I'll let you know if I see anything and send you pictures if I do. I really hope this isn't true. You and Maddie deserve better. Thank you. Luke's plea for clarity was met with a swift assurance from Jerry, a friend not just in proximity, but in moments of deep personal crisis. Jerry's willingness to venture into this uncomfortable truth on Luke's behalf spoke volumes of their bond, one cemented in mutual favors and shared histories. As Luke awaited the outcome, a mix of dread and the faintest hope battled within him, each second stretching into an eternity. As Luke grappled with the unfolding reality, his thoughts wandered through the years spent building a life with Luna and their daughter. He had poured his heart and soul into creating a home that was a manifestation of Luna's dreams, hammering and crafting each corner with dedication over three arduous years. To him, their life seemed content, fulfilled with shared moments and the laughter of their ten-year-old daughter. Yet recent changes in Luna's schedule, her increasing absences under the guise of work commitments, had planted seeds of doubt that now seemed to be growing into undeniable truths. The transformation in their intimate moments, though seemingly unaffected, now haunted Luke with questions. Could Luna truly drift away, endangering the sanctuary they had built together, especially when their daughter was at such a formative age? The torment of waiting for confirmation was excruciating. Then his phone shattered the silence. Luke, I'm sorry, man, but your wife and Dr. Zender had sex like two horny teenagers. I have photos and videos to send you. I don't think they noticed me. I'm really sorry. If you want me to do anything else for you, let me know. The evidence was undeniable, a visual testament to the betrayal. Overwhelmed by grief, Luke allowed tears to flow, a rare surrender to his emotions. It was then that Maddie's voice pierced his sorrow. Dad? 
Maddie, what are you doing over there? Go back to bed, honey. Everything is fine. I heard the phone ringing, and then I heard you crying. What's the matter? I am ten years old. I'm not a child. I need to know. Maddie's maturity and insistence on understanding the situation forced Luke to confront the reality that this betrayal did not just affect him. It was a wound inflicted upon their family, and Maddie deserved to know the truth. I'm crying because I just received proof that your mother, how should I put it, loved another man in the hospital. I'm trying to figure out what to do. She's finishing work soon, and I think I should wait to talk to her then. I don't think she'll be coming home today. I overheard her telling someone on the phone that she was happy they were going to spend the whole night together. I thought she meant work. I think you should call her right now. Let's see what she says. Okay, maybe there is some good explanation. In that moment, Luke realized the importance of confronting the situation head on, not just for his sake, but for Maddie's as well. The strength of his daughter provided a glimmer of hope that perhaps there was still a chance to salvage what remained of their family. Luke had always respected the boundary of not interrupting Luna's work hours with personal calls, reserving them solely for emergencies. As he dialed her number, the weight of the situation affirmed that this was, indeed, an emergency. Luna's breathless response came after several anxious rings. Luke, is something wrong with Maddie? You seem out of breath, honey. Are you okay? I didn't have my phone with me, so I had to run to get it. What's happened? Haunted by the images he had witnessed, Luke's voice was tinged with a mix of disbelief and sorrow as he replied. I thought you might have been short of breath because you just had sex with Dr. Zender. The silence that followed was heavy, filled with the unsaid and the fallout of what had just been revealed. Then, Luna's voice, resigned yet distant, broke the silence. Crap, he knows. Don't worry, Greg, I'll take care of it. Her words, not meant for Luke, but for someone else in the storeroom, confirmed his worst fears. Luna's ensuing apology did little to soften the blow. Luke, I'm sorry you had to find out this way, but I'm glad you know now. Her explanation, an attempt to justify her actions, fell on disbelieving ears. That's it, a little extra sex on the side to reduce stress. There's nothing special about it. This does not affect our marriage or the fact that I am the mother of our daughter. Luke's response was of a man struggling to reconcile the woman he loved with her actions. I'm afraid I don't quite understand it that way. Luna, unfazed, laid out his options with a cold pragmatism that chilled him to the core. Look, I need to get back to work. That's how it is. You have two options. One, let everything be as it is. We continue to raise our daughter. You get a loving wife who gives you sex from time to time, but sometimes has fun with sex with other men. Or two, you file for divorce, and I get half of our assets, the house in primary custody of Maddie. You will get every weekend and every other major holiday to visit your daughter. Here's how divorce works in our state. I guarantee that I will make your life miserable and find every excuse possible to cancel your scheduled visits. I know how much you love Maddie, so you really only have one choice. Her final words, a stark ultimatum, left Luke grappling with a reality he never imagined. After I finish this shift, Greg and I will go to a motel and spend the night together. Tomorrow I'll work a regular day shift, and tomorrow night I'll come home and we can talk. You will see that it is better for you to just continue to live as you are. Bye. As the call ended, Luke was left in a tumult of emotions, forced to confront a decision that would redefine the very fabric of their family life. In the kitchen's dim light, Luke and Maddie exchanged glances, their faces a canvas of conflicting emotions, anger, disappointment, and a profound sadness. The gravity of their situation hung heavily in the air. Well, Maddie, I don't know what to do. I don't think I can live here knowing that your mom has sex with other men. If I file for divorce, I won't be able to see you every day. I don't think at your age a judge would let you choose who you want to stay with. If I move out, do you think you can stay here with your mother? Hell no. Maddie, Dad, I'm already a big girl. If I have a choice, I want to be with you. Their options seemed painfully limited until Maddie, with the resilience of youth, proposed an audacious alternative. Dad, 
There is another choice. Which? Burn this bitch. What are you talking about? Remember my friend Beverly? Well, her dad caught Beverly's mom fooling around and just left. He took all the money he could and just disappeared. After some time, they caught him and arranged a terrible scam. You and I could leave her as little money as possible and just disappear. Maddie's suggestion, radical as it was, sparked a glimmer of hope in Luke. Where will we go? You know where. As the realization dawned on him, Luke hesitated, burdened by his past. I don't think they'll take me back. You can ask. I had a vision of us returning. Maddie, the granddaughter of a revered spiritual leader within the Turtle Mountain Chippewa Indian Reservation, offered a path back to a heritage Luke had once forsaken. Years ago, Luke had left the reservation, his youthful anger driving a wedge between him and his community. Enlisting in the army alongside his friend Tommy White Elk, he sought an escape but found only conflict. It was only after his service, touched by the horrors of war, that his anger began to subside. Reconnecting with his mother, he shared tales of their heritage and Maddie's illustrious grandmother with his daughter, weaving a bond with roots that stretched back to the Turtle Mountain Chippewa people. In recent years, Maddie had begun to show a remarkable ability to receive and decipher visions, a gift that Luke quietly nurtured. Luna, for her part, remained largely in the dark about Luke's family history and the teachings he passed on to Maddie. Luke had made it clear early on in their marriage that he preferred not to delve into his life pre-discharge, and Luna, respecting his wishes, rarely pressed for details. Okay, I'll call. Your mom won't be back until after five hours tomorrow. We have a lot to do until then. Meanwhile, Luna and Greg were hastily getting ready for their day after a night spent together, a night that left Luna feeling unfulfilled. Despite Greg's physical capabilities, Luna found herself missing the emotional connection she shared with Luke, recognizing that Luke had a way of making love that Greg simply couldn't replicate. The excitement she once found in her clandestine encounters with Dr. Zender and Alvary before him had diminished now that Luke was aware of her infidelity. The thrill of secrecy lost, she found herself contemplating ending her affair with Greg, especially considering his family's impending move to their town. Throughout her shift, Luna's thoughts were consumed with how to reconcile with Luke and restore their family, while also entertaining the idea of seeking new, discreet adventures in the future. She was confident in her ability to win back Luke's affections, secure in the knowledge that he would not deny her intimacy nor risk losing access to Maddie. As she left the hospital, Luna approached her car in the parking lot, only to discover all four tires had been slashed. Dismissing the act as petty, she saw it as an opportunity for Luke to play the role of the doting husband once she arrived home. How childish, she mused to herself. Well, here's a plan for you to do something nice when I get home. Luna attempted to reach Luke on his cell phone, only to be met with silence. Frustrated, she borrowed a colleague's phone, only to be greeted by a recording stating that the service for Luke's number was discontinued. It seemed Luke was escalating their silent battle. Well, she can too, Luna thought, her mind racing with strategies. The mere suggestion of divorce might be enough to bring Luke to his knees, but she relished the thought of watching him beg for forgiveness. She borrowed the phone once more to summon a taxi, her mind churning with plans for retribution during the ride home. As she neared her neighborhood, Luna's attention was caught by a plume of smoke slicing through the sky accompanied by the urgent sounds of fire trucks and police vehicles. Looks like one of our neighbors had a fire, she mused, only to be struck with horror as she realized the blaze was consuming her own home. Luna hastily exited the taxi, instructing the driver to wait, and dashed towards the chaos. The fire chief immediately barred her way. But this is my home. Where are my husband and daughter? Everything is all right with them. I think they're fine. Your neighbor said she saw them drive away right after they set fire to a pile of clothes. What? Luna's gaze fell to a smoldering pile in the yard, her clothes ablaze, with something else atop the fiery heap. It took her a moment to recognize the remnants of her wedding albums, the memories of her lavish wedding dissolving into ash. Surveying the scene, Luna saw that though the firefighters had managed to contain the fire, the home she cherished was beyond salvation. Luna noticed Mrs. Jensen, 
her neighbor standing by the sidewalk with a look of disapproval. Approaching her, Luna was met with a scowl. They are gone. I hope you're happy now. What are you talking about, Mrs. Jensen? Luke and Maddie came to me before they lit the fire. They'd wanted to ensure my house wouldn't be caught in the flames. They shared everything with me. How could you do such things to such a good man and his daughter? I hope you feel this pain for a long time. It's just a misunderstanding. Wait, are you saying that Luke started the fire? But he built this house with his own hands. This was our home, our beautiful home. Where are they? Your husband said that he had every right to tear down what he had built. He told me a house ceases to be a home the moment you ceased being a wife and a mother. He burned the house. You destroyed your home. Luke and Maddie have left dear. They aim to vanish to a place you'll never find them. And I wish them all the best. With those words, Mrs. Jensen turned and walked away, leaving Luna to absorb the gravity of her actions. The fire chief later approached Luna, explaining it would take days before the ruins could be sifted through for any remnants of value. He inquired if she had somewhere to go. After a pause, she said, My parents. Seated again in the taxi, Luna directed the driver to her parents' address, her mind a whirlwind of thoughts. She vacillated between hoping for Luke's return and reconciliation, and plotting a bitter legal battle should she find him. Upon arrival at her parents' home, the reality of her situation hit her as her payment was declined, and she found herself relying on her father for financial assistance. Tears welled up in her eyes for the first time that day, a sign of her desperate need for her parents' comfort. Harry, her father, cracked the door open slightly, his expression unreadable. What do you want? Dad, it's me, Luna. Let me in. Something terrible happened. Luke, I know what happened. Luke and Maddie stopped by on their way out. How could you? He was like a son to me. And Maddie, our only granddaughter. We thought we raised you better. I'm sorry, but you're no longer our daughter in our eyes. Dad, what are you talking about? It's just a misunderstanding. Luke will come back, and I'll fix everything. Please, I need to speak with Mom. Misunderstanding? Is that the term for it now? How can you even say that? I've seen the evidence. He showed you the photos, didn't he? My God! Where's Mom? I need to explain everything to her. The door remained firmly in place. Your mother's in bed. The shock was too much. The doctor had to sedate her. We're just grateful she didn't suffer a heart attack after seeing those photos. Did Luke show Mom the photographs? How could he do that? He didn't want to at first. But your mother insisted she couldn't believe her own daughter would do such a thing. Act so against everything she was taught. Against her faith. So I showed her the photos myself. She fainted right away. She's made it clear she doesn't want to see you. Not now. Maybe not ever. With those final words, the door shut. Lacking the courage to request money for the taxi fare, Luna found herself returning to the taxi, tears streaming down her face. Where to now? The driver inquired, sensing the need for a destination where financial transactions could be made. Realizing her credit card was rendered useless, Luna, after a moment's hesitation, directed him to her younger sister Leslie's residence. Despite their strained relationship, Leslie had always been a doting aunt to Maddie. Leslie's reputation had taken hits over the years, labeled unfairly by peers and falling out of grace with their parents. Luna was uncertain about the welcome she might receive, yet in this moment of desperation, Leslie represented her last strand of familial hope. As she approached, the door opened wide to reveal Leslie, her expression one of anticipation rather than surprise. Great good, I waited for you. Dad probably called you. No, Luke and Maddie came here on the way. I thought that Mom and Dad might not be receptive to their daughter cheating since they still aren't too happy with their slut daughter. Before stepping inside, Luna hesitated. Before we go in, can I ask you a big favor? Actually, two favors. There's something wrong with my credit card and I need to pay for the taxi. And then is it possible to stay with you for a while? Luke burned down our house. After a moment of internal debate, Lisa's demeanor shifted towards understanding. Okay, I guess I owe you one. Thank you.
Once the taxi fare was settled and Luna found herself sinking into the comfort of her sister's living room sofa, she couldn't help but inquire. What did you mean when you said you owe me one? I don't recall lending you anything recently. You didn't. But living under the shadow of Miss Perfect, your stellar grades, impeccable appearance, and your esteemed career path drove me to the brink. The constant comparisons made me resentful. I embraced failure just to carve out my own identity, separate from yours. But now you've inadvertently cast me in a more favorable light. Everyone adores Luke. How many times has he lent his skills for the community or involved himself in charitable work? This house was practically a monument to your achievements, and yet you've mared his reputation. Maddie was a joy, the light of my life, and Luke? He was the epitome of a loving, devoted spouse. And your gratitude? Betrayal of the worst kind. I'll tell you this, if Luke ever considers reconciliation, I'd plead for a chance with him. To spite my flings, I'd trade anything to be the partner he deserves. You, on the other hand, are the epitome of selfishness and arrogance. I hope you feel the weight of your actions as deeply as he does. Don't hold back on my account, Luna retorted with heavy sarcasm. You can't fathom the pressure I was under, the stress. I believed I was entitled to a lapse, to seek solace elsewhere. It was just a fling, but Luke made a mountain out of a molehill. He'll regret his reaction. You're delusional. You need professional help. Your reality is galaxies apart from the rest of us. There's no excusing your actions. It wasn't just a fling. It was adultery, a profound betrayal. Moreover, you threatened him, saying he had to come to terms with being an old fool, or you'd deny him access to your daughter. That's akin to emasculating him and making him parade his shame. No man of worth would tolerate your behavior. And Luke, he's the epitome of manhood. You're welcome to stay, if only to witness firsthand the consequences of your actions. Well, now he's powerless to hurt me further, but I'd not without recourse. He took my daughter without my consent. That's kidnapping. He'll find himself answering to the law. Let's see how fond he is of his cellmates. Luna endured a night of turmoil under her sister's roof. Come morning, she took leave from work to sort through the wreckage of her life. She was startled to find that all shared assets and accounts had been transferred solely into her name. Joint bank accounts, the mortgage, her car loan, credit cards, even the cell phone plan. A significant portion of their shared wealth had been moved to her personal savings, providing her with the means to secure new accommodations and begin replacing her belongings. By day's end, she reached out to the insurance company regarding the fire only to discover Luke had terminated their homeowner's insurance. The realization hit hard. There would be no insurance payout for the house. All that remained was the land where their home once stood. Thankfully, the mortgage was fully paid. At least she was spared the burden of a loan for a house reduced to ashes. As the day progressed, Luna grappled with one revelation after another, each underscoring her newfound responsibilities. Tasks once managed by Luke now fell squarely on her shoulders, illuminating the extent of his contributions to their shared life. In her pursuit of justice, Luna recognized she had confused the protocols for reporting a missing person with those for reporting child abduction. While a missing person report necessitated a 48-hour waiting period, a kidnapping could be reported immediately, offering her a legal avenue to pursue. Upon her arrival at the police station, Luna was greeted by a desk sergeant who listened intently as she declared her intent to file a kidnapping report. Who has been kidnapped? My daughter, Maddie. Madeline Ray Hall, she's 10. And you are her mother. Yes, I'm Luna Hall. Is there a father involved? Yes, Luke Brown. He's the one who took her. The sergeant's attitude shifted noticeably at the mention of Luke's name. Luke Brown, the carpenter. So is this about a custody issue during a divorce? No, there was no dispute. He just took her and left, and he set our house on fire before leaving. A smile briefly crossed the surgeon's face. Our house. He set our house on fire. I failed to see the humor in this. I apologize. It's just that Luke's actions have earned him a certain admiration among men who've been wronged by their spouses. How are you aware of this? I spoke with the officers at the scene of the fire. Besides, news travels fast in a small town. So are you going to assist me? I'll perform my duties. 
the sergeant muttered under his breath, adding, It's a shame you didn't fulfill yours. Luke once built a ramp for my mother, saving her from having to move into a nursing home. I'll do what's required, but don't expect any special treatment. Fuming with frustration, Luna watched as the sergeant prepared the necessary paperwork. All right, when did he supposedly take your daughter? Between Sunday evening and 5.30 Monday evening. That's quite a broad time frame. I was at the hospital for my shift and only got back Monday evening. That's when I realized they were gone. Do you have any clue where they might be? Not exactly. Luke was quite private about his family. Being Native American, he might have gone back to his reservation. That's valuable information. Do you know which tribe or reservation? I'm not sure. Aren't there a limited number of tribes? Actually, there are over 300. You seem unfamiliar with Native American matters. Their territories are almost autonomous, with their own governance. Our requests might not be prioritized the same way they are elsewhere in the country. We could distribute flyers, perhaps get the Interior Department involved to circulate them across the reservations. Is there anything specific that might help us narrow the search? I can't think of anything immediately. Hold on, though. Luke's former employer is an army buddy of his. He might have some insights. All right, it might be worth speaking with him. He could be more receptive to you than law enforcement has been. Do you have any recent photos of them? I don't have any on me. Luke was the photographer in our family. Unfortunately, most of our photos were lost in the fire. So you're telling me you don't have a single photo of your husband or daughter in your wallet or on your phone? I do have one of Maddie on my phone, but it's a few years old. She looks quite different now. That says quite a bit about your relationship with your husband and daughter, he sighed. But I did like Luke. Perhaps your parents have some more recent photos. Bring those when you can. Personally, I don't bother keeping photos in my wallet. That's what albums are for. Returning to work for the first time since the ordeal, Luna immediately sensed a shift in the atmosphere. The warm greetings she was accustomed to were conspicuously absent. Conversations ceased when she approached, and colleagues who previously addressed her informally now used her surname. After enduring several awkward interactions, Luna sought out Sheila, a colleague and friend of over five years. What's happening, Sheila? Why does it feel like I've become a pariah? That's exactly how we see it. You've become toxic, Sheila bluntly stated. The whole hospital is buzzing about your affairs with the doctors. We all assumed your husband was oblivious or just didn't care. But thankfully, he proved to be stronger than we gave him credit for. The head of security enlightened us about the kind of man your husband truly is, a war hero, no less. And let's not forget about your daughter. It's well known that staff engaging in affairs during their shifts compromise patient safety. There have been multiple occasions when you were unreachable during your scheduled shifts. One time, you even had the audacity to come in with a love bite. I'd rather not delve into it. Just know, while we'll continue to perform our duties, don't expect any camaraderie from us. With those final words, Sheila departed. War hero. Luke was never a war hero. He's a carpenter. Someone's been spreading falsehoods. The following day, without a day shift to anchor her, Luna decided to confront Luke's boss and friend, Milton. She drove to the construction company, parking her car in front of the office. Inside, she approached the counter where Milton was stationed. Hello, Milton. Is Luke on the job today? Milton responded, No, he resigned on Monday. If he wasn't such a close friend, I'd have given him a piece of my mind for leaving us in the lurch. But after hearing about your actions, I can't help but support him fully. Is there anything else? I'm swamped right now. Do you have any clue where he and Maddie might be? No clue. And even if I did, I wouldn't tell you. You have no idea how much I owe that man. Milton's voice cracked slightly, hinting at tears. I heard someone claim he was a war hero. But wasn't he just a carpenter in the military? That's the tale he spun to ease the minds back home, Milton said with a light chuckle. But the truth? He was part of the reconnaissance team. His Native American heritage led them to see him as a natural scout, tasked with leading missions. Luke was always the first into the fray. It's as if he had a guardian angel clocking in overtime.
The number of times he walked out of a skirmish unscathed is unbelievable. He's pulled me out of the fire more times than I can count. Did you know he was awarded both a bronze and a silver star for his bravery? I had no idea, Luna replied, a bit taken aback. He never mentioned any of this. You said he's Native American. Do you know which tribe or reservation he's from? I can't help you there, I'm afraid. The only person he ever discussed that with was his close friend, Tommy White Elk. And where can I find Tommy? He's passed on. Tommy was killed shortly before their tour ended. It wasn't Luke's fault, though. He tried to save him, dragging Tommy from the battlefield under heavy fire to save others. Despite his efforts, Tommy was beyond saving by then. It was for that bravery Luke was awarded the Silver Star. Milton's tone grew somber. Now, I really must get back to work. Luna was left to ponder. Great, I've betrayed a war hero. It seems things couldn't possibly get any worse. Why didn't he share more about his past? I wish I could ask him now. What a mistake I've made. Upon arriving at work the next day, Luna found herself alongside Dr. Xander, summoned to the administrator's office. They exchanged no words, both sensing the gravity of the situation. Mr. Chambliss addressed them sternly. It has been brought to my attention that the two of you engaged in a sexual relationship on hospital premises during work hours. It appears I'm the last to know of this indiscretion. Initially, I considered a reprimand for your files. However, after receiving calls from every member of the hospital board questioning my response to this matter, it became evident that your termination was the only option to preserve my own position. Effective immediately, your employment here is terminated, Mr. Chambliss declared with a finality that left no room for negotiation. Security has been informed and will escort you to retrieve your belongings from your lockers. Furthermore, you are both required to present yourselves before your respective professional licensing boards. Given the precedence, it's likely your licenses will be suspended for a minimum of one year. I hope the fleeting pleasure was worth the ensuing disgrace, not to mention the financial implications. Now leave my office. As they exited, Gregory cornered Luna with a venomous look. Your dear husband decided it was a good idea to send a letter and photos to my wife. Thanks for that, you've ruined everything. I hope I never have to see your face again. And for the record, despite what you might think, the sex was hardly memorable. With her locker now empty, Luna was engulfed by the gravity of her situation. No job, no home, no husband, no daughter, no friends, and no family willing to stand by me. All I'm left with is myself. What's my next step? Meanwhile, Luke, with Maddie by his side, made a crucial phone call. Hello, Turtle Mountain Nature Reserve. Could I speak with Hank Garcia, please? Who's asking? Came the cautious reply. Maybe it's best I don't say. Hold on then. I'll check if he's available. After a tense wait, Hank's voice came through. This is Hank Garcia. Identify yourself, or I'm ending this call. It's Luke Brown. I'm looking to come back. Hank's tone hardened. You've got some nerve calling here after everything. You're not welcome. Please, just hear me out. I'm not alone. The Cloud Maiden's granddaughter is with me. There was a brief pause before Hank inquired further. How old is she? Has she shown any signs? Maddie's ten. She began having visions a couple of years back. It was her vision that foresaw our return. Hank sighed, the weight of the decision palpable even over the phone. You know well that not many here are inclined to welcome you back. I'm aware, but I'm not the same person I was, the young reckless fool who turned his back on his family and heritage. I'm here to seek the tribe's forgiveness, Luke confessed, his voice heavy with remorse. Hank was straightforward in his response. Look, if it weren't for your granddaughter, Cloud Maiden's descendant, I wouldn't even consider bringing up your return with the council. And even then, there's no assurance they'll welcome you back. Her name's Maddie, Luke clarified, a hint of pride in his voice, short for Madeline. My mother, Cloud Woman, predicted I'd have a daughter. She was the one who helped me see past my unjust resentment towards my family and our people. Knowing she wouldn't be around to guide her granddaughter, she left instructions for me to follow before Maddie could be entrusted to the elders' care. Despite her young age, Maddie's remarkably wise. I'll speak to the council, 
Hank offered, a note of tentativeness in his voice. Can you make it here by 7 p.m. the day after tomorrow? Give me your contact information so I can confirm your arrival. We're currently heading north. We'll make it by then, Luke assured him, providing his number before ending the call. Maddie, attempting to comfort her father, said, Don't worry, Dad. Cloud Woman will be with us. Later, Luke was informed that the council had agreed to an urgent meeting. The elders who had fond memories of Cloud Woman were persuasive enough to allow Luke an opportunity to present his case. When Luke and Maddie stood before the Turtle Mountain Council, Maddie quickly became the center of attention. The council bombarded her with inquiries. What abilities have you manifested? Would you consent to train under a healer, even if it means being separated from your father? Can you demonstrate your visionary powers? Overwhelmed by their questions, Maddie responded with simple, candid replies, admitting her inability to showcase any talents on demand. The council thanked her for her honesty and dismissed her. Before the council convened, Little Dove, a healer, had a private conversation with Maddie. When the council reconvened, one of the members posed a question. What's your opinion on the potential abilities of this young girl? Cloud Woman has always been my guide, and I've sensed her presence countless times, the healer shared, reflecting on the profound spiritual lineage. Her essence is vivid in her granddaughter, yet the influence of the modern world is undeniable. It'll require significant effort to discern if she can forge a potent link to the spiritual realm. Should we permit her to stay among us? Absolutely, came the response brimming with optimism. I'm up for the challenge as an instructor, and she appears genuinely keen to learn. Nonetheless, she was adamant that her stay is conditional upon her father's acceptance. They come as a unit. Without him, she refuses to remain. Following the healer's departure, the council found unanimous agreement on the girl's place within the tribe. However, Luke's inclusion was met with hesitation. Faced with indecision, they sought Hank's counsel. Hank proposed a compromise, allowing both to stay, provided Luke performed an act of contrition for the community. Should Maddie's spiritual potential not manifest, they would both depart. Luke pondered deeply over an appropriate gesture of remorse. With his skills in carpentry, he observed the tribe's medical facility in disrepair. A structure so neglected, it seemed more likely to breed illness than cure it. His contribution would be the construction of a new clinic, a sanctuary of healing. The healer, alongside Maddie, selected the ideal location for this new beacon of wellness, awaiting the council's approval. With the green light given, Luke embarked on his mission. Having previously spearheaded the construction of a clinic in Nicaragua, Luke was no stranger to such projects. This time, however, the financial burden was solely his to bear. Without seeking assistance or receiving any offers of help, he dedicated several months to erecting the clinic meticulously. Upon completion, a ceremony to bless the new clinic marked Luke's conditional reintegration into the tribe. Though he remained under probation, not all were content with this decision. One evening, as Luke made his way back to their lodging, he found himself abruptly seized, a stark reminder of the lingering divisions within the tribe. Luke endured a brutal punishment, his skin lacerated by thorny branches, ensuring the marks of his transgression against the tribe would be indelible. This act was meant to symbolize the permanence of his betrayal. Throughout the ordeal, Luke remained stoically silent, absorbing the pain without protest. Later, as Maddie tenderly treated his wounds, she harbored thoughts of retribution. Luke, however, viewed the punishment as a necessary evil to convince certain tribal members that he had atoned sufficiently. Time marched on and Luke secured employment in carpentry, working both at nearby oil fields and within the city, commuting alongside fellow tribesmen. It was a lucrative endeavor. Amidst this period of relative normalcy, flyers surfaced bearing old images of Luke and Maddie, labeling them as missing, though omitting any mention of the abduction. Subsequently, a flyer offering a $5,000 reward appeared, a sum Luke cynically noted might tempt many on the reservation. Maddie, now a radiant 14-year-old, was tasked with selling authentic-looking local jewelry to tourists and casino patrons. Her charm was irresistible, even as she harbored a secret about the merchandise's true origin. One day, Maddie confided in her father about a vision of her mother's return. 
Luke, confronted with the inevitability of facing Luna and her potential claims over Maddie, sought guidance from Cloud Woman, the spiritual matriarch whose name Maddie now honorably bore. It's time to confront this, Maddie declared, expressing a desire to meet Luna. You must see her. While engaging with tourists at the gift shop, Maddie's gaze fell upon a blonde woman whose presence instantly resonated with her. Approaching her with the grace of a seasoned salesperson, Maddie inquired about her interest in the necklaces, subtly complimenting her. The woman, struck by an inexplicable familiarity, requested a smile for Maddie. Upon seeing Maddie's radiant smile, Luna was overwhelmed by a flood of emotions, sensing a profound connection to the girl before her. The Maddie Luna had committed to memory was distinguished by a conspicuous gap between her front teeth, yet the girl before her boasted a flawless smile. Disheartened, Luna decided to purchase a necklace nonetheless. As they conversed, a familiar voice reached Luna's ears from behind. Hello, Luna. It was a long time ago. Without needing to look, Luna recognized the voice as Luke's. Closing her eyes briefly to compose herself, she then turned to face him. Finding his expression more severe than she recalled, devoid of any welcoming smile. Despite her longing for a warm embrace, his indifferent gaze dissuaded her. Luke, I'm so glad to see you. I have so much to tell you, but please tell me where Maddie is. I'm dying to see her. Come back. Maddie, witnessing the exchange, approached with a tearful smile. Hello, Mom. I missed you. Their reunion was marked by an emotional embrace. I missed you too, honey. You've grown so much. You are simply amazing. I can't believe I sent you both away. I'm very sorry, very sorry. After the initial rush of emotions, Luna turned to Luke, her intentions clear. I'm not here to open old wounds. I would like to be able to apologize and spend as much time with Maddie as possible. Luke's concern was palpable. Are you going to try to take her with you? No, I don't want to ruin your life again. I just want to be with Maddie for as long as you let me. And what about your job and boyfriend or husband? When I was sure you two were here, I quit my job and put my things in storage. Since you left, I haven't had a boyfriend or husband. I dated some, but no relationships worked out. You taught me a harsh lesson, but I deserve it. I haven't been with anyone since you left. I didn't want to start a new relationship until I healed my old one. I didn't start a new relationship either. The reason is that I was afraid that I could no longer trust a woman. It didn't work the first time. By the way, we're divorced, aren't we? Yes, the divorce was necessary for me to access certain government benefits after my nursing license was temporarily suspended, Lunan explained, revealing the pragmatic reasons behind their legal separation. Have you left nursing behind then? Luke inquired, curious about the path Luna had taken since their separation. No, my license was reinstated after a year. I secured a job with a salary comparable to what I was making before. It allowed me to support myself and even save a bit. I furthered my education, earning my APR and Luna shared, outlining her professional resurgence and personal growth. Is there anything Maddie might need that you'd be willing to let me purchase for her? Luna asked, eager to contribute to her daughter's well-being. Luke's initial reaction was one of slight offense. No, Maddie has everything she needs, he stated firmly, before a smile broke through, softening his demeanor. And almost everything she wants. She's already a teenager after all. Maddie then entered the conversation with a question for her mother. Mom, you won't stay for long, right? The decision is yours and your father's. I've booked a room at the Economy Lodge Hotel, Luna said, highlighting her temporary lodging arrangements. That place is notorious for bedbugs. You will stay with us, Maddie declared confidently, making her stance clear. No, I can't impose on you and your father like that. Baby, Luna protested, hesitant to intrude. First of all, I'm not a child and we have a spare bedroom. Now let's go get your luggage, Maddie insisted, displaying a maturity beyond her years. No, I need to have a discussion with your father first, Luna countered, seeking Luke's approval. Maddie and I have already discussed everything, Luke interjected. Having you stay with us will make it easier for you to spend time with Maddie. But understand, this arrangement doesn't imply anything beyond that. 
You're here as Maddie's mother, and that's all. Understood. I just hope you'll allow me to contribute by helping with cooking and other household tasks. I won't be comfortable otherwise. Luna expressed her desire to be useful during her stay. I hope your cooking has improved then, Luke quipped lightly, hinting at past culinary misadventures. Sorry, Mom, but your cooking sucks. Maddie added, joining in the lighthearted moment, which elicited laughter from all three. Following the moment of levity, Luke directed Luna to her room, then went to retrieve her belongings in the jeep. Their drive took them through the tourist-centered part of the reservation and into one of the residential areas, where they stopped at a home adorned with Western Plains and Native American decor. Upon entering the spare bedroom with Luna's luggage, the room's feminine ambience was unmistakable. Luna, taking in her surroundings, asked, Is this your room, Maddie? It was Songbird's room. Maddie clarified, indicating the room's previous occupant. She's my father's cousin who was there for us when we needed extra hands to look after our father. Now that I'm older and we don't need as much help, it could be nice to have you around to help out a bit, Maddie explained, her voice quivering as tears began to form. I'm so glad to see you again, Mom. Luke, can we talk? Luna said, her tone serious. You might not want to hear what I have to say, but it needs to be said. Luke said nothing, his presence a silent testament to his willingness to listen. For the longest time, I refused to admit my faults, despite everyone around me pointing them out. It wasn't until my mother confronted me, her tears a mirror to the pain I caused, that I realized the extent of my actions. The thought of being the barrier between her and her granddaughter was unbearable. That's when I sought therapy, striving to better myself. These are mere words, I know, but I hope you'll see the change in me and allow me the chance to reconnect with Maddie. I don't expect forgiveness. I've accepted the consequences of my actions. I'm sincerely sorry for everything. Luke remained stoic, his expression unreadable. Internally, he acknowledged the truth in Luna's words, recognizing them as just that, words. Yet, knowing Maddie wanted her mother around, he resolved to tolerate Luna's presence for his daughter's sake. As time went on, a new daily rhythm emerged within the household, one that seemed to work for everyone. Luna took on the majority of the household chores and dedicated her time to bonding with Maddie and learning about the tribe's culture. She was careful to maintain a respectful distance from Luke, ensuring her actions couldn't be misconstrued as flirtatious. Dinner conversations reminded them of times gone by, though Luna's previous nursing schedule had often kept them apart. One evening, Luna approached Luke. I've been here for several weeks now, and I've cherished every moment spent with you and Maddie. I think it's time we discussed what comes next. Luke's response was quick and tinged with anger. You're not thinking of taking Maddie away, are you? Absolutely not, Luke. That's not what I'm suggesting. I don't want to leave with Maddie. The issue is, I can't keep living off your generosity. I need to find a job. I've already spoken to the clinic on the reservation. They've offered me a position. It's not much, but it's a start, Luna said, trying to lighten the mood. It's time we considered whether I should find my own place. Luke, caught off guard, asked, Don't you like it here? I appreciate being here, Luna began, her voice tinged with uncertainty. I'm just not sure if my presence is as welcome to you. Our marriage left us with a mix of memories, both joyful and painful. Observing you, I've been unable to gauge whether you prefer I stayed or left. At times, you seem content, yet at others, it's as if you're on the verge of tearing down everything we once built together. What do you believe would be best? Luke lived in the moment, shielding his heart against the possibility of trusting her once more. Despite this, Luna's transformation was undeniable. She had seemingly returned to, if not surpassed, the person she was when they first married. I think I need more time to think, Luke admitted. Perhaps my decision would come easier if you weren't here. I found a place in Montana I can afford. It's close enough. I'll move my belongings there tomorrow. Regardless of what happens, I'm thankful to you and Maddie for giving me a chance to be part of your lives again even if I may not deserve it. That night, Luna was awakened by the sound of crying. Clad only in her nightgown, she hurried to Maddie's room, only to find her daughter sleeping peacefully.
Realizing the cries were emanating from Luke's room, she approached hesitantly. The door creaked open to reveal Luke, sitting on the bed in his underwear, hand in hands, weeping. Luna sat beside him, her own tears mingling with his. James watched, captivated by the vision of her, the glow of her skin like moonlight. It was a moment of awakening for him, a vivid reminder of life's pulsing vitality. Compelled, he followed her, gathering the pieces of clothing she left in her wake, though he couldn't explain the impulse to do so. Reaching the top, he found Kelly, an enchantress not yet vanished into the night. With a gesture both intimate and mesmerizing, she released herself from the confines of her bra, revealing herself in full glory. James was spellbound, his heart thundering, his mind a whirlwind of desire. Come and take me, she whispered, igniting a chase that echoed the primal rhythms of desire. It was as if the words of George Clinton, the visionary behind Atomic Dog, had been written for this very moment. The chase wasn't just a pursuit, it was a revelation. In her bedroom, Kelly awaited him, an invitation made flesh. She undressed him with deliberate slowness, each revealed inch of skin worshipped with her touch, her tongue. Their clothes mingled on the floor, symbols of their impending union. Kelly eyed James attempted to speak, but she silenced him, her actions speaking volumes more than words ever could. Where Emma's touch was gentle, Kelly's was fervent, a storm to Emma's calm sea. She communicated her desire, her availability, her commitment to him without reservation. Their exploration of each other was thorough, a testament to their mutual desire. Kelly succeeded in her silent vow. She drew his thoughts away from the past, anchoring him firmly in the present with her, and painting visions of a future together. Kelly understood the pain of betrayal all too well, having experienced it firsthand. She remembered the bitter lessons of her past, the realization that fidelity was not guaranteed by beauty or love alone. This understanding, born of her own heartbreak, colored her approach to love and trust. The harsh words of her former lover echoed in her mind, a cruel reminder of her past pain. A woman, no matter how beautifully she is wrapped, becomes stale after a while, and you need to find a fresh one. With those words, she walked away from him, her heart set on finding someone who would cherish her uniqueness and love her unconditionally. She believed James could be that person, especially after witnessing the tenderness he showed Emma. When James's marriage crumbled, Kelly saw it not just as an end, but as a beginning. A chance to love and be loved in the way everyone deserves. Emma, however, was not ready to let go. Weeks turned into months, and still, the divorce papers remained unsigned. She concocted a plan to even the scales by attempting to catch James in a compromising situation with Kelly, hoping it would derail his petition for divorce and somehow mend their fractured relationship. Emma clung to the belief that their shared transgressions could pave the way back to each other's arms, despite her deep longing for his return and her deteriorating health. One day, Emma's desperation led her to a fateful encounter. Through the window of a restaurant, she observed James and Kelly sharing a tender moment. It was a scene of genuine affection, not the fleeting thrill of a fling. James's love for Kelly was unmistakable, shattering Emma's denial. Overcome by a mix of jealousy and realization, Emma confronted them, her anguish spilling over in a public outburst. Despite her claims and threats, it was clear that James had moved on, his heart now irrevocably intertwined with Kelly's. In the aftermath of her outburst, Emma's health took a turn for the worse. The cancer she had once battled with James by her side returned with a vengeance. Hospitalized and alone, she faced her illness without the support that had once given her strength. The absence of a loving presence by her bedside made her struggle all the more harrowing. Luke, what's wrong? Can I do anything to help? My being here seems to only cause more pain, she whispered, her hand tracing the scars on his back. Scars she had never noticed before. These scars are the price I paid to regain the tribe's respect, Luke revealed, burdened by his past. It's all because of my mistakes. If only I had remained faithful, none of this would have happened. I thought I had suffered, but I never faced physical punishment. I'm so sorry. What can I do to make things right? Luna implored, desperate to alleviate his anguish. After a moment, Luke managed to find his voice. I don't deserve your kindness. You can't stay. 
It's too difficult for me. I'm truly sorry for the pain I've caused. I was a fool. I'll leave at dawn. I'm sorry. As she made to leave, Luke's hand caught hers, halting her retreat. My struggle is with the overwhelming desire to be close to you again, as we were in our marriage, he confessed. Your beauty captivates me, and memories of our intimate moments and simple embraces haunt me. My heart aches at the sight of you, and the resentment I harbored for your betrayal is dissolving. I realize this isn't why you returned, so perhaps it's best you go back to your new place. Knowing you're near yet not within these walls is torturous. Maddie can visit you, and you're always welcome here as a guest. Tears streamed down Luna's face as she mustered the courage to respond. Luke, coming back, I was uncertain of what I sought from you. Doubting you could ever forgive me, I've longed for a second chance with you and Maddie. My deepest wish is to return as your wife, to prove my unwavering love and fidelity. If you wish